Hey there, Black Sheep. Welcome back to the channel. And this week's episode of This Bites. We're finally getting back on schedule after I had COVID for like two full weeks. And we're jumping in with a doozy. If you're new to the channel, This Bites is a series in which we analyze the weekly Watchtower study, the article that will be discussed the coming weekend at your local Kingdom Halls. And we see how the writers and the governing body have implemented the BITE model. If you're unfamiliar with the BITE model, it's the go-to method used to identify cults and the methods that they use to coerce, manipulate, recruit, and control members. This weekend, Jehovah's Witnesses will be going over study article number 36 in the August 2022 magazine. And the article is entitled, Jehovah's People Love Righteousness. Also, I'm going to blame Halloween for my, I don't know, 90s prison gang look. <laughs> it's not a beauty channel, okay? Paragraph one, I didn't detect any bite model, um, just general misogyny. Paragraph one, we jump right into a story of sexual harassment in the workplace um, with a story about Potiphar's wife uh, continuously making advances towards Joseph, who was uh, his, a slave in their household. Joseph said no, that he couldn't commit such badness against Jehovah, and that's why he continuously turned her down. But uh, I would like to point out that if he was a female slave, he wouldn't have the liberty to say no to her. In fact, Exodus 21, 7 through 11, not going to read the whole thing, but it says that if a man sells his daughter into slavery, uh, that she will not go free the same way that a slave man does. If her master is not pleased with her and does not designate her as a concubine, he can resell her only not to foreigners. Um, he also has the option to assign her as a concubine, AKA sex slave for himself, or to allow one of his sons to marry her, which I'm sure she would have no say in. So there's that. Or he can keep her, marry someone else, but he still has to make sure she's clothed and fed and sexed. So, good thing Joseph was a man. Paragraph two says, how did Joseph know that his God would consider adultery as an act of great badness? The Mosaic law, which included the clear command, you must not commit adultery, would not be written for another 200 years. It goes on to tell you that Joseph knew Jehovah well enough to perceive how Jehovah would feel about immoral conduct. Joseph acted on a matter of principle. And as we spoke about before, principles and matters of conscience in the Jehovah's Witness religion are usually enforced as laws. For instance, birthday parties. Everyone knows in the media, your neighbor down the street knows Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate birthdays. And that's actually based on principle. It's not a law. So if there was a Jehovah's Witness that wanted to celebrate a birthday, technically they could. But they might get in trouble for it. More, more, They will definitely get in trouble for it. And they will definitely be listed as bad association. And all of these principles are the uh, perceived understanding of a collection of unrelated scriptures that the governing body has deemed as Jehovah not liking birthdays because they're not presented in a favorable light in the Bible. Principles and laws in the Jehovah's Witness uh, religion kind of go hand in hand. Joseph was able to. Joseph could perceive the understanding of God's words even though the law wasn't written down. But you, you need someone to perceive for you. Again, no bite model detected. You know, wanted to warm you up with a little bit, with a little bit of seduction and adultery. Paragraph three says, 
Do you love righteousness? No doubt you do. There's no doubt how you feel and what you love. You love righteousness. No doubt about it. There's only one correct answer here. Emotional control. Manipulate and narrow the range of feelings. Some emotions and or needs are deemed as evil, wrong, or selfish. This is that governing body one-two punch. Uh, they hit you with the fear and then they hit you with the guilt. It's time. They switch it up a little bit. First, they hit you with the guilt. Then it says, but we all are imperfect. And if we are not careful, the world's view of righteousness can easily affect us. This is emotional control. And still fear, such as fear of thinking independently in the outside world. Paragraph four and five, in true Watchtower fashion, they're going to define a word for you. They're defining the word righteousness. The paragraph says, when people think of a righteous person, many may think of someone who is smug, judgmental, or self-righteous. Way to assume, Watchtower. Then they say that others come up with their own standards of righteousness. According to paragraph five, righteousness means doing what is right in the eyes of Jehovah God. So that's the definition. I'm sure if you looked it up in Oxford, it would be the exact same thing. Doing what is right in the eyes of Jehovah God. It's going to say that. And towards the end of the paragraph, it states that in order to please Jehovah fully, a person who is truly righteous considers how Jehovah will view the decisions he makes. Both of these paragraphs are using thought control. Thought control. Require members to internalize the group's doctrine as truth. Adopting the group's map of reality, or definition of righteousness in this case, as righteousness. Instill black and white thinking, decide between good versus evil, and organize people into us versus them, insiders versus outsiders. In these two paragraphs, they clearly established that there are others who um, have their own idea of what righteousness is and create their own standards of what righteousness means, and that there are truly righteous people, and thus meaning that there must be unrighteous people. So there are definitely othering in creating those insiders versus outsiders. Paragraph six says, Jehovah is the only one who can properly set the standards for what is right and what is wrong. Because Jehovah is perfect and his sense of what is right and what is wrong is far above our own view. That was nice, Stephen Lick. Far above our own view. <laughs> Which is often influenced by our imperfection in sin. It then requires the entire congregation to turn in their Bibles and read Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways, declares Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This scripture is going to be used to make Jehovah's Witness distrust themselves. Your imperfection and your sin has made it so that you can't trust your thoughts and your standards. Jehovah's thoughts are correct. He is perfect. And you shouldn't trust your own judgment. When I'm doing these, I don't normally look up all of the scriptures, um, but the other recommended scripture in this paragraph is par uh, Proverbs 14, 12. And it says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So according to the article's reasoning, so thus far, and these two uh, scriptures that they've placed in here, trusting your instinct, what feels right or seems right, according to this, leads to death. So, that's fun.
thought control, rejection of rational analysis, critical thinking, constructive criticism, emotional control, promote feelings of guilt or unworthiness, such as your thoughts, feelings, actions are irrelevant or selfish. And like we talked about before with principles being enforced as laws and matters of conscience being kind of enforced as laws because it doesn't necessarily matter about your conscience, but if your conscience says yes and your brother says no, and then you do it anyway, you could be responsible for stumbling or discouraging your brother. And so you're not gonna wanna do that. And so it encourages a sort of group that paragraph seven uh, kind of addresses that. You can't have everybody just doing what feels right to them because that would lead to chaos. It says that, you know, consistent standards are important and they give a couple of examples. They say that if every bank uh, came up with their own values for money, that things would be inconsistent. But that's kind of how money works. Like the dollar and the yen aren't equal. One dollar and one yen don't equal the same thing. So uh, they say, but they say that that can lead to chaos. Um, the other example they give is that of uh, hospitals um, not delivering the same level of care or following the same policies. And my goodness, that happens all the time. Uh, in the article, they say that in, um, inconsistent standards in hospitals can lead to death. Well, yeah, uh, even though I'm addressing uh, worldly inconsistencies at the moment. That's why the infant death rate of people of color is two times higher than that of white women in America. Like, <laughs> these are two just bad examples is what I'm trying to say. They used bad examples. The paragraph goes on to say, God's standards of right and wrong protect us. Emotional control and still fear, such as fear of thinking independently. Behavior control, and still dependency and obedience. If you think independently, according to this paragraph, it leads to chaos and death. And while maybe personally you believe that God's standards protect you, or believing Jehovah's Witnesses are being told that Jehovah's standards protect them, um, I would like to bring up a very serious um, issue of inconsistency when it comes to standards in the Watchtower Bible Tract Society. So if you'd like to look further into this, I'm going to have a link in the description below to jwfacts.com. This in particular deals with the 1999 yearbook of Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, on the website, you're going to see excerpts from that book. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses used to put out yearbooks every year talking about uh, different brothers and sisters from around the world and their experiences and their testimonies of faith. And so the 1999 yearbook, um, featured a lot of brothers and sisters from the Malawi in Africa. They were fe facing a lot of persecution. And they were facing persecution because Jehovah's Witnesses are sworn to political neutrality and not going to war. And in Malawi, it was the law that you were supposed to carry a political party card. And because they're Jehovah's Witnesses, carrying a political party card was out of the question. They're not part of this world. They do not support the government because it's controlled by Satan. And so they weren't going to do this. And so because of that, so many people were murdered, tortured, R-word, 
that rhymes with graped. They even mention it in a watchtower that um, some of the some of these people were elderly children, pregnant women that caused miscarriages because of the torture and um, physical assaults that they had to endure all over religious neutrality. But if we go back a little further in Mexico, it was the law that you had to serve or enlist in like the army reserves for at least a year and then you would get a little paper saying you you did your service for the country or whatever and because Jehovah's Witnesses again are no part of the world and they claim political neutrality and don't go to war they weren't supposed to do this um, and there was a letter from the Watchtower Bible Tract Society to the Mexico branch the Mexico branch is then in charge of distributing the information to the local elders who are then in charge of the local brothers and sisters. You see, there's a chain of command. And so the Watch Our Bible Track Society sent this letter saying that if the authorities accept uh, bribes, money, in order to purchase one of these uh pieces of paper saying that they did this um, military service, then and their, account, and their conscience allows them to do that, then that's fine and no discipline is required. So why would the Mexico brothers and sisters be okay to have this government card, even bribe officials? But those Malawi brothers and sisters didn't get a letter like that. They got martyred. For a worldwide brotherhood that is being overseen and approved by Jehovah, these are two very drastically different enforcements of Bible standards. It just seems like God's standards didn't protect those brothers and sisters in Malawi. Paragraph 8 says that those who are trying to live by his standards um, will be blessed by Jehovah and that the righteous will possess the earth. So if you're not trying to live by his standards, you're not going to inherit the earth. And um, yeah, you're, you're going to die. Emotional control and still fear such as fear of Losing one salvation. Paragraph nine, there's only three sentences in this paragraph, but they're all so powerful when it comes to manipulation and the setup of the mindset that Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to have. So we're just gonna take them one by one. The sentence says, in order to love righteousness, we need to grow in our love for the one who sets the standards of right and wrong. That one being Jehovah. And how do Jehovah's Witnesses grow in their love for Jehovah? Well, they would say that you would grow in your love for Jehovah just like you'd grow in your love for anyone else. You have to get to know him better. And how do you get to know him better? His word. Oh, but you can't perceive his word so you need this Bible aid, AKA the publications written by the Watch Our Bible Track Society overseen by the governing body. They're going to help you to perceive as they understand so that you can draw close to God because you can only do it through them. And a, a believing Jehovah's Witnesses would definitely argue that point. However, take for example, if you were to go out in service, the ministry, and tell somebody, okay, well, I would like to have a Bible study with you to help you to build a friendship with God. And they're all about it. They want to build a friendship with God. And as soon as you get there, you pull out the Bible and you pull out 
Watchtower Bible Tract Society publication. And they say, I thought we were going to study the Bible. But um, even when you're meant to do personal study and your daily Bible reading, they tell you, it's okay if you don't understand it. If you don't understand it, go to um, one of the index books or the Watchtower online library and look it up and there will be descriptions or an explanation of the scripture if you don't understand it. But they are implanting their interpretation as your interpretation because only they can perceive what Jehovah really means in the Bible. If that interested one insisted on only using the Bible, the believing Jehovah's Witness would be lost. They more than likely would prep beforehand so that they could use the magazine without using the magazine or book. Um, it may be like study ahead of time so that they have like designated scriptures in their head to make the points that the book told them to make. They're not going to sit with you and read scripture by scripture and have a discussion because that's not how you come to know Jehovah and love him. Information control. Extensive use of cult-generated information and propaganda, including newsletters, magazines, journals, audio tapes, videotapes, YouTube, movies, and other media. The latest study aid that Jehovah's Witnesses are using out in service, I believe it's called the Enjoy Life Forever book, um, with the man that's walking. And uh, that book is an interactive Bible study. So it actually incorporates all of the propaganda. Uh, it will have the questions, the leading statements, and then it even has videos included. So then you can go to the website and watch a video with emotional music and scripted testimonies. The next sentence says, the more we love Jehovah, the more we will want to live by his righteous standards. Emotional control. Promote feelings of guilt or unworthiness, such as you are not living up to your potential. Your family is deficient. Your thoughts, feelings, actions are irrelevant or selfish. If you're not wanting to live by Jehovah's standards that are interpreted for you by Watchtower, then do you really love him? You don't love Jehovah enough, or maybe not even at all. Because it goes on to say, if Adam and Eve had loved Jehovah, they would never have disobeyed his law. Adam and Eve are the two Bible characters that are blamed for all of the world's tragedies. Your loved one dying, that's, that's Adam and Eve's fault because they sinned and then all of their children inherited sin, and because of sin, we became imperfect, and because of imperfection, we claimed death. And so, everything terrible that's ever happened is Adam and Eve's fault. And this paragraph is putting you in the same boat as them, if you don't want to live by Jehovah's standards interpreted for you by the Watchtower. Let's read the sentence again. Adam and Eve, if they had loved Jehovah, they would never have disobeyed. So, do you see what they've done here? If you do love, you obey. Love equals obeying. Your level of obedience is tantamount to how much you love your God or Creator. Emotional control and still fear, such as fear of independent thinking, losing one's salvation. Adam and Eve thought for themselves. Guess what? They died. The entire article basically boils down to obey or die. Moving right along, paragraph 10 and 11. If you don't want to end up dead and damned like Adam and Eve, then you have to 
keep learning about Jehovah, appreciating his qualities and ways of thinking. And how do you do that? You can't do it like they did by having a conversation with Jehovah or like most other people in the Bible did by having a conversation with Jehovah. No, because Jehovah he doesn't talk to his people anymore. He doesn't want to talk to you, okay? And you can't do it by using your own thoughts or your own interpretation of what the scripture means. Because remember, you can't trust your own thoughts. You're sinful and imperfect. So how do you continue to uh, appreciate his qualities and ways of thinking and learn more? You need the governing body. You need the watchtower. You need the meetings. This is what they're getting at. It then goes on to use what I believe to be some of the most dangerous of all Jehovah's Witness rhetoric not the most dangerous of their teachings or laws, but the most dangerous of their mindsets. The paragraph says, Consider Abraham. He truly loved Jehovah. Even when he found it hard to grasp Jehovah's decisions, Abraham did not rebel. So when Abraham didn't understand, he didn't rebel. So when you don't understand the governing body, you shouldn't rebel. They say this so often, it scares me. They say that uh, even if it's hard for you to, from a human standpoint, for you to grasp what is being told to you from God's channel, that it's not up to you, that obedience is required. It does say that when Abraham had some questions, he was able to actually ask Jehovah and receive direct answers so that he could understand God's reasoning. But you don't, you don't have that luxury. So who are you going to ask? You can pray about it. Maybe you can go to your elders. You can maybe write a letter or call the branch headquarters, but you're not likely to receive a direct answer from the governing body. So what do you do when you don't understand? You stop worrying about it, basically. Thought control. Teaching thought-stopping techniques, which shut down reality testing by stopping negative thoughts and allowing only positive thoughts, including Denial, rationalization, justification, wishful thinking, meditating, and praying. And this is where it gets dangerous. So they go on with the use of Abraham as an example of obedience. And it says that Abraham trusted Jehovah and simply set out to do what Jehovah asked of him. He knew that Jehovah would never do anything unrighteous or unloving. And this is in reference to when Jehovah asked him to sacrifice his son, murder his son. Again, Abraham simply set out to do what Jehovah asked of him. This is your example. It then uh, uses the reference for this, uh, Genesis 22, 1 through 12. And I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Verse 10 says, Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. And just to lighten the mood a little bit, since I'm not going to read this harrowing description of a uh, man lying to his son and attempting to murder him because he heard a voice in his head. Here's a little bit of levity from our friend Jay the Comedian, who is also an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Hey, what's poppin'? This your boy Jay the Comedian. How you doing today? You have some amazing looking tear ducts, by the way. Anyway, so let's get to this whole Abraham, Isaac, and Jehovah situation. You're not gonna mean. So, I always looked at this scripture and wondered, are we really worshiping the good guy in this situation? Really? Because 
For anybody to ask anybody else to do something like that, you get the inkling, yo, that's kind of messed up, right? Now, I see they're trying to say, well, you know, they knew Jehovah, and, and they, they had a respect for him, and they trusted him. So, that's, you know, they just showed that, and it's all normal and fine, and, you know, no biggie, right? No! That is psychotic. That is crazy. For somebody to say, oh, you love me, huh? You trust me? Okay. Go stab your son. <laughs> like, really? I'm going to give you some pushback. Because, I mean, what, what reason could God have for that, you know? Well, you know, I've been with people who in the past, they say they love me, but they wasn't even willing to, like, stab their son or nothing. So, from now on, you got to prove it like that. That's the only way you're going to do it. <laughs> This entire story is crazy. And I've had this story told to me before in the past when somebody was trying to explain to me how it's okay to shun your own family because Abraham was willing to take the life of his son until Jehovah was like, ha, just kidding. Like, that entire thing is crazy. Anyway, that's my little take on it. Back to Jenna. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, Jay. Now back to the article. This is the level of blind obedience you're meant to have. Again, your love and trust for God is being equated to your willingness to obey. In summary, paragraph 12 just says, again, that in order to love God and draw close to him, that you need to continue to learn and understand his way of thinking, his way of thinking on things. His and his and his and his and his. Paragraphs 13 and 14. Work at developing love for righteousness day by day through regular study effort. As a Jehovah's Witness, again, you, it's not once saved, always saved. Yes, Jesus died for your sins. And every day, day by day, through regular study effort, you must work and prove that you were worthy of that sacrifice, that you're worthy of being saved and not annihilated at Armageddon. The Jehovah's Witnesses have daily spiritual goals, weekly spiritual goals, long-term spiritual goals. For instance, there's a daily text. Uh, the daily text is a book that comes out annually. And so in this book, it's a uh, scripture and then Underneath the scripture is a paragraph or two, an excerpt from a watchtower to help you understand the application of that scripture. You should have the daily goal of reading the daily text, reading your Bible daily, doing personal study, making all the meetings, making all the meetings, studying ahead of time for the that meetings, can contribute in a thoughtful and you positive way. You can have the spiritual way. goal of you can make a goal to go out in service at least once contributing a more when it comes to taking on assignment or twice a week you or don't normally talk to and then expand in your regular your pioneer and, and getting 70 hours a month. you get it there's no end behavior control major time spent with group indoctrination and rituals and or self indoctrination including the internet paragraph 14 then says righteousness is not a burden it's a protection, something we need every day. Reminding you that every day you need to put on the suit of armor, the spiritual suit of armor and the breastplate of righteousness because you're under attack. You're constantly under attack from Satan's world and from your own devious mind. Emotional control and still fear, such as fear of thinking independently, the outside world, enemies, losing one's salvation. Paragraph 15 answers the question, how can you put on the breastplate of righteousness? This, this entire paragraph is just all literally just, uh, I don't even, I don't think I have enough of these. I'm, I'm just going to have to read it as is. When deciding what to talk about, your conversations, your personal conversations you're having, what music to listen to in your car by yourself on the way to work, what entertainment to watch or what books to read. First ask yourself, what would I be feeding my heart? Would this material meet with Jehovah's approval 
or does it promote immorality, violence, greed, selfishness, things that Jehovah views as unrighteous? Our text this morning, Proverbs 27, 11. Do you remember what that says? Oh yeah, it says, be wise my son and make my heart rejoice. Hey, Kayla, you want to play? Come on, it's fun. No thanks. Your conversations, the books you're reading, what you're watching on TV, the music you're listening to, all of these things you must filter through the standards set for you by the governing body's interpretation of the scriptures. This is another rare area where Jehovah's Witnesses can become extreme. Behavior control, restrict leisure, entertainment, vacation time, information control, Minimize or discourage access to non-cult sources of information, including internet, TV, radio, books, articles, newspapers, magazines, media, critical information, former members. Keep members busy so they don't have time to think and investigate. Paragraph 16 and 17 is to encourage you if you are feeling overwhelmed by all of these restrictions and expectations. It says, do you ever worry about whether you can continue living by Jehovah's righteous standards day after day, year after year? Jehovah promises that our righteousness can be like the waves of the sea. How? When you have a decision to make, First, consider what Jehovah would want you to do. Then, follow through, no matter how difficult the decision might be. This comes down to even people's love lives. Behavior control. Permission required for major decisions. Behavior control. Discourage individualism. Encourage groupthink. Thought control. Rejection of rational analysis, critical thinking, constructive criticism. If you've ever been a Jehovah's Witness, paragraph 18 is just a joke. <laughs> it says, step three, leave the judging to Jehovah. <laughs> While we try hard to live by Jehovah's righteous standards, we must avoid judging others and becoming self-righteous. This isn't part of the bite model. I, there's no bite model in this paragraph. I just, it, it's, it's actually good advice. <laughs> but it's 100% not how Jehovah's Witnesses live their lives. Because Jehovah's Witnesses are constantly having to be on guard to protect their precious relationship with Jehovah, they're on guard from even members of the congregation because they might prove to be bad association. Just because they're Jehovah's Witness doesn't necessarily mean they're going to encourage you spiritually, or maybe they're lacking in some way. Maybe they listen to music with swears in it. You're on guard from the people who are sitting next to you, baptized Jehovah's Witnesses. You're on guard from your unbelieving family members. You're on guard at school because your classmates don't believe in Jehovah and they could try to influence you. You're on guard at work. You're constantly on guard from people so that you can perceive whether they're good association or not. Perceive or judge. You're constantly judging all of the time. All the time. That's what you do. It's a cute idea though. Paragraph 19 is also very dangerous in that it encourages you to use the example of Joseph. It says that Joseph showed that he trusted Jehovah by forgiving his brothers when they assaulted him, 
sold him into slavery for years and years and lied to their father that he was dead. He forgave them and left the judging to Jehovah. Be like Joseph. This is terrible advice for a religious group that encourages women to stay in abusive relationships because it's not a scriptural divorce just because he gave you a black eye. It's terrible advice to women or children who may have been uh, sexually abused and go to their congregation elders and tell them and their abuser is repentant so they suffer minimal consequences in the congregation. Maybe they don't get to comment for a few months. They don't get to raise their hand or whatever. But the authorities aren't involved because he's or she's repentant. This is terrible advice. Just forgive. Be like Joseph. Joseph got assaulted. He got sold into slavery. And he forgave. He left the judging to Jehovah. Don't judge this brother or sister because they sinned and did this terrible, terrible thing to you. This is awful. It's... This is awful. When I first started waking up and started watching apostate material, I stayed away from the apostates who made angry material, who were angry. But this paragraph, paragraph 20, is the license that all XJWs need to be that angry apostate and to fill that role because it's just, it's upsetting. It's, they say to remember that you, believing Jehovah's Witnesses, can't read hearts and that you should never assume someone's motives and that Jehovah loves all kinds of people from all different backgrounds and cultures. And Jehovah encourages us to open our hearts wide Open your hearts wide, but close them when it comes to your adult child who has decided that they don't agree with everything that they've read in the watch shower anymore. And even though that they, they can be respectful that you continue to want to live your life by those circumstances and, and won't, you know, push their own beliefs on you or, and you know, they want to have a continuing relationship with you, even though they believe something different. They don't, don't have your heart wide open for that. No. In that case, it's loving to not even to say a greeting to that person, to not even take a meal with that person. That's how you show them Jehovah's love. If they turn their back on Jehovah, you turn your back on them. That's Jehovah's love in that case, which is not judging. <laughs> Sonia Erickson has been disfellowshipped. It crushed my whole family. So no judgment, but you can't sit with us. Later, my father explained to me that I couldn't remain in the home because I refused to change my lifestyle. He told me I was having a negative effect on my younger brother. They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. I missed being with my family. Paragraph 21 just sticks the other knife in and says, this also means that we are not to judge those outside the congregation not people like myself now outside of the congregation. You can judge me because judging and shunning me is loving. Um, 
So this also means that we are not to judge those outside the congregation. And would you ever judge a relative who does not share your faith? <laughs> would you? <laughs> would you ever judge a relative who does not share your faith? saying that man will never come into the truth no that would be presumptuous and self-righteous that's what this paragraph says <laughs> wondering how he was doing was he okay Then, as hard as the past few weeks had been, it just got harder. I knew what the Bible said about quit mixing in company with anyone who is not living according to Christian standards. But I never thought that scripture would one day apply to me. Despite what that paragraph says, that d this, it doesn't, it, it's two standards. Remember how we talked about consistency and standards and how Jehovah is supposed to have that consistency in his standards. You wouldn't judge a non-believing family member or family member that has a different faith than you. But then you do judge those who leave the congregation or leave Jehovah's Witnesses and now have different beliefs than you. So do, don't do do it, but do do it. You get it? Behavior control. Dictate where, how, and with whom the member lives and associates or isolates. The paragraph says, Always remember that self-righteousness is a form of unrighteousness. So, they said it, not me. And the last paragraph, paragraph 22, wants you to remember, just in case you didn't get all the other warnings, that the world is bad, danger, 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 and you have to constantly be on guard and work, 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 work for your salvation. Be assured that Jehovah takes note of your efforts and that he will always be pleased with your progress. As this world plunges deeper and deeper into unrighteousness, take comfort. Emotional control and still fear, such as fear of thinking independently, the outside world, enemies, losing one's salvation, leaving, or being shunned by the group. That's the end of the article, and at this point, we are going to score it. Normally, because this is the last study article in the whole um, magazine for August 2022, I would tally up the entire score and give the entire score for the month but I missed a couple because of COVID. So we only have this one and one other. Um, so let's go ahead and tally up this score. I wish I could score it for how much it hurt my feelings, but that's not how this works. So for behavior control, we have eight. For information control, we have two. For thought control, we have Four. And for emotional control, we have eight. So that gives us 8,248. I'd just like to say thank you to all those who wished me well when I was dealing with COVID. And thank you for everyone sticking it out with me and joining me for uh, this episode of This Bites. If you enjoyed your time here today, please give the video a like, leave a comment, subscribe, and ring the bell so you'll know next Friday when we take a bite out of the next Watchtower article. Continue thinking freely, Black Sheep.